Welcome to the Queen City, Charlotte, North Carolina. It's a sellout again for Supercross at its very best. Hello, everyone, and welcome to round 11 of the U.S. Supercross Series. I'm Art Ekman, along with David Bailey. Tonight, Mike LaRocco sees a little bit of light at the end of the title chase. He's only 16 points in back of Jeremy McGrath now, and he's coming off his second victory of the season, David. Well, things couldn't go much better for LaRocco than they have. He's had two weeks to savor that last win, and he's the defending champion here in Charlotte. Very confident, and he showed us that in practice already. He looks very smooth and relaxed. LaRocco's gotten some help from other riders as well. as Brian Swink, Mike Kudrowski, Michael Craig, all three finished in front of McGrath. Well, when McGrath has a bad night, he slides way back and it allows other guys to slide in there. And Mike Craig and Brian Swink rode fantastic in the last round, and I hope that can continue. Speaking of title chases, we might see a number one plate handed out tonight to a Frenchman named Miguel Pichon. Well, I like this kid, and, uh, you know, he's a lot like Jean-Michel Bale in terms of coming from France and dominating here in the United States, but he's more personable, a little less stubborn, and well-received. He only needs 10 points to clinch that title, and I think he can do it. Smallest track on the circuit. Let's take a look at our Suzuki track map. The lap times will be considerably less than what we've seen so far this season. And you see a long whoop section up there next to the starting line. Riders are going to be blitzing through there. The guys that are at the toughest tonight will prevail. The third member of our broadcast crew, Marty Reed, is in the pits. All right, as we get ready for tonight's uh, 125 main, we can talk a little bit about the fact that they have changed the layout of the track, the technical side of it. The last three races, the feedback has been it's been too tough, and the teams that don't have the high budgets to do a lot of testing have felt that they're at a disadvantage. But don't think that the relief they've gotten here tonight makes this an easy layout. It's very tight here in Charlotte, and remember, we're in the land of NASCAR, where Rubin is racing, except these guys are doing it without fenders. The number one plate in the East of the 125s is on the line for this young man, Mikel Pichon, when we come back. This edition of ESPN Speed World is brought to you by Honda, defending champions and holders of the past seven consecutive Supercross titles. Honda, come ride with us. And by Suzuki. Right now, your Suzuki dealer has the ride you've been waiting for. And the financing to get it. This is a 1-800-COLLECT call. From hey, this is your son, Jeremy. Your son, Jeremy. Trying to be funny? <laughs> I've been eating pretty good. Doug and I were just hanging out. Cheese. I'm not an actor. What am I doing? Jeff's doing good. He says to say hi. Hi, Dad. <laughs> Steve says to say hi. Hi, Mom and Dad. Say what? I think we're going to take it tonight. No, I'd rather have it on your bill than mine. I'm getting ready to go race right now. Mom, guess what? We just won the championship again. Getting ready for the start of the 125 main. Let's take a look at the Suzuki starting grid. Number 26, Mike Brown from Gray, Tennessee. That's about as close to Charlotte, North Carolina as you can get. Also, Jim Chester's a local rider out of North Carolina, number 97. What's going through Pichon's mind right now, David? Well, he only needs 10 points to capture his first Supercross title. And I think he's probably just going to have to play it safe out there. He doesn't really impress me as a fast starter. He always comes from behind, and I think there's plenty of time for him to pick up those points tonight. He likes to relax, get a feel for the track before putting the target zone on the top competitors. Pichon coming off a win at Pontiac, his third win of the year. He's only missed the podium once, and that was a fourth place in Houston. You see number 101 right next to Mike Brown, number 26 at the starting gate. And one thing, David, about Charlotte, North Carolina, we got some great fans here. You sure do, and I can't help but remember a few years back when Damon Bradshaw, their hometown favorite, gave him what they paid for. A very enthusiastic crowd on hand. Just about set now. Mikel Pichon right in the middle of our screen along with Mike Brown. They should be the ones to look at as they get set now and starting to rev up the machines and the gate goes down. Andre Penny, number 614 with an outstanding start along with Mike Brown. 
Roy is up there as well. Pichon is in seventh place. Richardson and Maximoff go off the track on the first turn. Our Honda track cam is right at the end of one of the big triples. It's Andre Panay out in front. Number 78 is Roy. Look at all the scrapping going on right there. Roy getting bumped around, and Mike Brown does the triple and takes the lead. Mike Brown has taken the lead. The Honda Troy Ryder, who did so well in his last race, he led for the first 12 laps at Pontiac before fading to second. I shouldn't say fade, really, because he came off a three-week hiatus with a bad injury in the chest. Right. We mentioned that about a dozen times in Pontiac. I'm going to go ahead and take one more right here. <laughs> but it's very difficult to come back from an injury and get your timing, get used to riding amongst all these riders in this competition. But he got the start he needed tonight. Mike Brown into the long whoop section. Moving into second place is Davey Yezik and Panay in third as we go to a Honda jump cam. And look at that fantastic triple jump. Yezik does not take the triple. Neither does Panay. And Jeff Nutter, Mike Brown's mechanic, all thumbs up, David. Well, Brown's the only one doing the triple right now. That should help him open up a comfortable lead. Let's take a look at the Suzuki field summary. We'll be back with more 125 action in a moment. We're back in Charlotte. Art Ekman, David Bailey, and Marty Reed with 125 main event action. We're looking right now at Mikel Pichon. Now, Mikel has moved from seventh place up and is really threatening to get into the top three right now as we see action back with Andre Panay. 101, Pichon. I love watching Pichon ride through that loop section there. Just perfect timing everywhere. This kid sets the bike exactly where he needs it to be. And that's why he just looks so effortless out there. Mike Brown, our leader, Davey Yesick in second. Pichon is gunning for third. The Frenchman's mechanic is from New Zealand, and Marty Reed is with him now. Andy, does he have enough time? Does he have enough left? Yeah, I think he's, uh, he's just got a little bit of a bad start. It wasn't so bad, but he always starts off kind of slow and takes him a little bit to get up to the pace of it. Mike Brown's been injured lately, so he'll probably get tired. So, yeah, it shouldn't be a problem if he doesn't make any mistakes. It definitely looks like he's cutting into the lead. Yeah, I think he can do it, no problem. We're back with our leader, Mike Brown. Look at him through the whoop section. He's pulling the front end up quite a bit higher than what we saw Pichon doing earlier. Pichon relying more on timing than Brown doing it with strength. Boy, Brown showed strength right there going through the Honda track camp. And here's Pichon. He's picking up time doing the triple as well. James Dobb, who had a tremendous run. Bad start for James. He started in 17th, was running in 5th and had to pull out of the race. Maybe problems with number 16, the bike right in back of him. Yeah, it seems odd. He looks healthy enough right there that, that uh, he wouldn't have to pull out of that race. Probably some kind of a mechanical. Pichon now making his move toward Davey Yezik, number 37. Mikel, he's not satisfied with just getting points in the championship. The number one plate at the end of this race. He wants second place right now. Over the finish line jump. Mikel making his move on number 37. Pretty nice move around the outside. That's pretty demoralizing for anybody. When you're getting passed on the outside, that guy's got to be going quite a bit quicker. And Pichon gaining time on the leader now. Pichon in second place. Yesik not ready to give up yet. Pichon about three seconds behind the leader, Mike Brown, as we take another look at the pass. All right, well, here's in a reverse angle. Pichon just carrying a lot more momentum. You see how aggressive he is around the outside like that? And it wasn't really anything that Yesik did wrong. Pichon's just going that much faster. Back to live action now. Mike Brown, number 26, with a fairly good lead. Greg Rand has hit the deck, and he's right over near the starting gate, all wrapped up with the banners. Well, he sure has a lot of help getting going again. You know, I don't remember having that much help when I fell down. Look at all those guys. <laughs> Greg Rand from Hillsboro, Ohio. As we take a look at the Suzuki Field Summary, it's Mike Brown in the lead with Pichon on the move. Back to Charlotte, North Carolina in a moment. Welcome back to Charlotte, the 125 main. It's Mike Brown from Gray, Tennessee, out in front. Mikhail Pichon, though, is closing the gap in second place as we take a look at the Honda stopwatch and get us an interval. Oh, my goodness gracious, Pichon cased it so hard. And he looks hurt. He slowed almost to a... almost looks like he's going to pull over. He didn't even come close to doing that triple. A terrible impact in the face of that jump. As we see the other riders come through our Honda stopwatch for the interval times, uh, Yesik has now moved into second place in front of Pichon. The question is, can he stay in the race? Can he fight through the pain? He hit it awfully hard. Well, it looks bad right now. He doesn't look too comfortable. I think a lot of times you can regroup. I've never seen anyone take quite that bad of an impact before and recover from it. It's and he be didn't tough. go down, David. That was the big factor. That's amazing that he stayed up. His, it looked like his face went into the handlebars, both his wrists. I mean, I can't even imagine how much that must have hurt. 
Michonne needing an 11th place to get the number one plate as we see the interval. It's only a 50-second lap time. Pretty short compared to usual as we look at Mike Brown, who just keeps circulating, riding a smooth pace. Now he doesn't have Pichon breathing down his neck and possibly can pick up his first win. I don't want to do this to you, but we're going to take another look at this impact by Pichon. Cover your children's eyes. Bam! Into the face of that jump. Look at the impact from his head. That's it's a like, good uh, reason to have a chest protector on. Well, it's a good reason to have a full face helmet, too. Otherwise, he'd have taken a bite out of that crossbar. And right now, he's looking over at his mechanic like, oh, my wrists. He had a right wrist operated on, David, just six months ago and has recuperated well from that surgery. But, boy, something like that could pull it apart. Well, he's still out there, and he's able to do a couple little jumps right there. You can see he slowed for the finish line jump, not wanting to do that impact. And uh, possibly there was a rider down. He seems to have recovered pretty well, and he's got a decent lead over the rest of the field. Although he is in third place, it's going to be tough for him to drop all the way back past 11. Throughout the season, Mikel has shown us his charm. Well, right now, he's showing us how tough he can be. He's a wonderful young man. I got a chance to sit down and talk with him earlier. He arrived on the scene for three races back in 93. You could tell back in 1993, that smiling 16-year-old from a small town near Le Mans. If given the chance for a full Supercross season in the U.S., he'd be back for more. When I am in San Diego, San Diego Stadium, it's very impressive. In France, we have a little stadium, but very little, and the track are very small. My, my dad uh, rode uh, when he was young. He's like my dad, but sometimes he's like my brother because we, we do everything together. If I want to go running, come with me. If I want to go skiing, come with me. Everything I do is with me. My mom can't come because I have a little, little sister and uh, she has to go to school. It's uh, same on top, but instead of rounding off a lot, this one is very smooth. Like Pedro Gonzalez of Mexico last year, Mikel is having to learn English completely as he goes. The biggest problem of us was if we were testing, he can speak English, but when it came to testing terms, whether the bike was leaner, softer, harder, too rich, um, tires weren't hooking up. Still got that bump in front of the triples. I don't have to jump the first turn before. It was very difficult at the beginning, but now it's much better. It's easier for me to speak with my mechanics, with somebody in the team, but for, for the interview, it's, it's pretty hard. <laughs> One thing Mikel has accomplished without the spoken word, he is becoming a fan favorite. He respects fellow countryman Jean-Michel Bale, but wishes not to be compared with him. Yeah, the people are very good with me. I was very surprised because Jean-Michel Bale said uh, the American fans are very bad, and Bale was, was a, a good writer, but uh, he did nothing for the people, so you have to go to the people. No, no, the people can come with you, to you. Mikel's smile broadcasts his happiness. He loves his work, loves the weather here, loves large stadiums and fans. Plus... Rollerblade, rollerblade. Rollerblade. Rollerblade, yeah. yeah. And I, I try that and it's, it's very cool. So I go shopping with that and it's very cool. It's the first time I try that and so I, I crash a lot of time. But uh, now I, I, I'm pretty good now. For the young man who enjoys flying bikes through the air and rollerblading into swimming pools, what is his biggest fear? Flying, no. I hate. I'm, I'm afraid every time. Every time. All the time. Because, uh, and I dream also. When I sleep sometimes, because I dream, uh, I crash with uh, flies. But uh, all the time, I prefer truck. <laughs> Bashan has a good work ethic, professionalism, and outstanding technique. He knows, however, getting stronger is essential for collecting on his hopes and dreams. My dream is to stay here for four or five years. Maybe more if I can, if Kawasaki wants me more. Or, but I would like to, to go in a, in a big truck, Kawasaki, maybe in two years or three years. That, it's my dream. <laughs> Those factory guys in the big truck better start getting a locker ready for this fun-loving, flying Frenchman. But David, I told you he was quite a guy. Oh, he is. He's quite a guy and quite a rider. Right now, really gutsy performance by this kid. Obviously in a lot of pain. He's looked like considered pulling off. 
and he could. There's a couple races left where he could wrap this thing up, but I think he wants to put a close on it. And, uh, of course, it depends on what's wrong with that wrist or arm, too, uh, whether he would have another chance to, to go out there again. That's true. Sometimes it, your adrenaline and everything can get you through something that later you just look back and go, how the heck did I do that? But uh, I think he'll be happy with the outcome tonight. He's going to probably be a champion. Here's our second place rider, number 37, Davey Yezik. Mike Brown way out in front right now. But number 101 really showing us what he's made of not letting the fourth place rider, Barry Karsten, catch up with him. Paul Curry's got the hay bale uh, cover in the chain. I've seen Paul Curry ride some local races in Florida. An excellent rider, pretty young. I think he has a bright future, but uh, not with the hay bale stuck in his swing arm. Here's our leader, number 26, Mike Brown, just going through the motions, really, as he heads toward the checkered flag. This would be his first victory of the year. He had one victory last year. That was at Indianapolis. But this season, he's come back from three weeks off of a chest injury to take a second place, and now a victory for Mike Brown. The top six didn't change for the last eight laps. David Yezik in second place. But our real story is the third place finisher coming around, Mikel Pichon, who will take that number one plate here tonight. A painful performance, but uh, one worthwhile. First season over here in the Supercross, and he picks up the championship. Nice ride for Pichon. You can see he's still favoring that right arm or wrist. It was that wrist that was operated on some six months ago. Mikhail Pichon, the champion. As we take a look at the Suzuki Series point standings, Pichon with the insurmountable 57-point lead on the injured Kevin Windham. Tim Ferry also injured, so opportunity reigns in the next two races for Davey Yezik and Mike Brown. Marty Reed's catching up with Mikhail right now. Mikhail, I know you're not feeling well. Is it the uh, right wrist? Yeah, it's all right, but you know, this wrist, I broke this wrist, this wrist last year, and uh, it was not very well before the race, and uh, I have a problem with this wrist, this wrist uh, with uh, six months, and uh, I, I didn't pass the third year before the triple, and I, and I learned too short, and I believed it was broken, but I feel pretty good, but uh, I don't know what is it exactly. So you think it's broken right now? No, no, maybe just, uh, I don't know if you said that, uh, just uh, cracks. Uh. Well, it was a gutsy ride. Congratulations on a, a gutsy third place. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> Taking a look at our final results, Mike Brown, of course, the winner. Yezik second, Karsten fourth, Nice fifth. Maximoff rounding out the top ten. Marty Reed is with our second place finisher, Davey Yezik. Well, I know, you know, they always say second place, you know, you don't want to be there. You want to be first, but it was still a good, strong ride for you. Yeah, you know, I haven't had too many podiums this year, and uh, I'm happy just to get on a podium. You know, Mike rode a hell of a race, and uh, I plain out couldn't catch him. He wore me out, but, uh, you know, I gave it the best I had, and... Uh, Second will have to settle for tonight. Now, this is a tough track to pass because it's so darn tight. Yeah, it's tough to pass, but Mikey just plain out beat me from the start to the finish, and uh, there's no excuses. He just playing with my butt. Outstanding ride for this young man, number 26, Mike Brown, who showed his stuff in the outdoor scene before really maturing as a supercross rider. Down here with 125 winner Mike Brown, and Mike, uh, after the injury and coming back, uh, and, and really fading at Pontiac because you just weren't in great shape. What a great win for you tonight. Yeah, this is the closest home as it gets, and I got a good start there and hung on. I wanted to win it really bad. And first one this year, and I think it'll help me for the next two races I got left. You uh, really seem to be in control of the race. We, and we talked to your crew chief, Jeff Nutter, all the way, and, and he just kept reminding you, ride your race, and you certainly did. Yeah, I kept putting it in my head. I'd get all tensed up and he'd come back around he'd help me out ride my race and i think the whole lap and he just helped me out a lot my arms getting didn't get pumped up like they did at michigan i, mean, I felt good the whole race and i could have had some more if i had some challenge i think i had a little bit faster lap times in me had it been 80 degrees uh throughout like it was here in the day would that have hurt you no that's what i've been riding in all week i don't live two or three hours from here and it's been humid like this all week 80 to 85 and rode every day in the hottest hottest time of day and it's helped me out a lot Congratulations on a great win. All right, thank you. So I want to thank Honda Choi and my mechanic, Jeff Nutter, for getting number here. Number one play to Mikhail Roy Pichon. Jackson, director of the U.S. Supercross Series. Well, Mikhail, again, welcome to America. On behalf of these thousands of fans here in Charlotte, the greatest motorsports fans in America, it is our pleasure to give you this number one plate. You've done a fantastic job this year. Congratulations. I know your arm hurts. I know you need to get to the ambulance, but thank you and congratulations. Thanks, Roy. What do you got to say there, Mikhail? Uh, I would like to thank Pro Circuit and Kawasaki 
and fit fire and I'm very happy and I hope to win lots of titles like this. Public address announcer Larry Myers with Mikel. An example of how the joys of his first Supercross championship and his first full U.S. season can wipe away the tears of pain. The 250 superstars coming up next from Charlotte, North Carolina. On the flashback from Charlotte, North Carolina, the year is 1994. Doug Henry, LaRocco, and a good starts. But Jeremy McGrath was back in the pack. Look at him right there on the outside, getting sandwiched. Nowhere to go. Swink also goes down. A bunch of riders go down, and McGrath has his work cut out as Doug Henry took the early lead. Number seven, here comes Mike LaRocco. Number 11 is Larry Ward, as the track was a lot more technical last year, but just as slick as we'll find out. And it was semi-local boy Larry Ward pressuring LaRocco early, but pressuring himself right into a mistake, letting Lampson by. LaRocco with the speed. Out in front, it's Doug Henry with Emig through the whoops. And while battling for the league, Emig went down. Left a lot of space for Henry, but LaRocco was on the move. As Mike LaRocco Sr. says, pick it up. And LaRocco did. Putting the heat on Doug Henry. He puts more than heat on him right here, right into the side. That's what you call a T-bone. Henry goes down and loses all these positions. And it became a battle of Kawasaki's as Mike Kaprowski started putting the heat on LaRocco. He came on strong in the closing lap. You'll see how close they finish. And another lap or two, who knows? Kaprowski could have taken it. The first of three wins on the season for Mike LaRocco as we go to our Suzuki highlights from the qualifying heat number one. Mike LaRocco would get the lead. Henry Kodrowski to hoop. Lampson and Craig in good position. But it was Doug Henry, number four, right here, coming through the woods, putting the heat on. LaRocco for the early lead. Watch what happens now as LaRocco sets up for the triple. We take a look at the Honda triple cam. And he hits just a little short. Henry breezes by. And then the mistake by LaRocco. Looked like a hay bale out in the middle of the track for LaRocco. Good news for Henry as he goes by for the lead. Craig then had his problems. He handed LaRocco the final transfer spot when he went down. It was the battle for second and third, David. Between Kodrowski and Steve Lampson right there doing the triple into the corner, but it was Mike Kodrowski holding on to that inside line. For his second heat win in a row, Doug Henry, and it was the fastest qualifying heat of the evening. Looking fast and smooth as he crosses it up for his second heat race win. Taking a look at the official results from Suzuki Heat Race number one, Henry, Kodrowski, Lampson, and LaRocco go directly to the main event. Our Suzuki highlights from heat number two, Jeff Emming, to get the whole shot. Well, he bursted out to an early lead with teammate John Dowd in tow, but it was Ezra Lust on the move, flying to the whoop section, couldn't make the turn, but at least this time he keeps it on two wheels. Emming would get the whole shot and lead every lap for his first heat race win of the season. But in back of him, here's the battle. Jeff Demet, number 77, goes down. Larry Ward takes his spot. The slick track taking its toll on a lot of riders. And Jeremy McGrath coming from eighth place, passing swing to take the final transfer spot. Up front, Dowd in second place behind Emig, and Ward, it tightened up. Look at this battle between Larry Ward and John Dowd. John Dowd shoots to the inside, gets sideways, and gives it back to Larry Ward, who holds on to the number two spot and closes in on Emmett. Jeff Emig, his finest heat qualifying race of the year, as he takes the victory, holding off Larry Ward in our Suzuki highlights from heat number two. So it's Emig, Ward, Dowd, and McGrath making it directly to the main event. Michael Craig has become an expert at winning semis and bringing the fans alive. As early as the fourth lap, Craig was doing can-cans off the triple. Behind Craig's whole shot to Chucker's win, Todd DeHoop went all the way in second place. There's the battle for second place. Doug Dubok, number 28, going into the crowd for some popcorn. can make the corner, drops two spots. Josh Steele slips into third place. So the final three qualifying spots as five come out of the semifinals to go to the main event is right there between Josh Steele, Dubach, and Decker. Michael Craig with another impressive semifinal ride. Nothing but privateer is going to the last chance qualifier as Craig, DeHoop, Dubach, and Steele advance to the main event. Our highlights from semifinal number two, our Honda track cam gets clipped by one of the riders. That is an unmanned cam, David. Well, I sure hope so. Uh, meanwhile, up front, it was an excellent battle for the lead between Ryan Hughes, Lusk, and Jeff DeMint. The former world champion, number 111, 
Greg Albertine also making a good move. This is his first race back after taking some time off with injuries. But the award for the fastest guy through the whoop section had to go to Ezra Lusk. He takes over the number three spot again and sets his sights on Ryan Hughes, but it's not over for Lusk. He rocketed back into the lead, taking both DeMent and Hughes. Then, the Banzai Lusk hits the deck once again. Looks back to see where Hughes is, but watch what happens to Ezra. A little bit too Banzai through the whoop section. Down he goes again, and he hands the lead over to Ryan Hughes. Hughes continues to look impressive on the 250s while he took the checkered flag. We had Kyle Lewis, number 15, who started in sixth, making his way up through to also go to the main event. So it was Hughes, Lewis, DeMent, Swink, and Albertine would qualify. Lusk, the only factory rider on his way to the LCQ, he would win that with Buddy Antonez taking the final gate position. So the field is set for the 250 main from a beautiful Charlotte, North Carolina. Let's listen in to a Roger DeCoster Suzuki riding tip. Many people enjoy racing on the weekends, but for a top factory staff, a lot more goes into winning than just showing up on race day. Even the fastest bike can lose a race if the rider is not in top condition. There are a number of things that you can do during the week that will help you to improve your race performance on the weekend. Increase your endurance on race day by developing a physical fitness program during the week. Aerobic activities such as bicycling and running increase the health ability to function in an efficient way. These exercises also strengthen the muscles in the legs. Stretching is also important to increase the flexibility and decrease the possibility of injury during a crash. In addition to aerobic conditioning and stretching, all the guys on Team Suzuki ride as much as they can during the week to improve their coordination and skill level. In addition to physical fitness, it's important to keep a healthy attitude if you want to do well on the racetrack. Most of us started racing because it was fun, and it is a good idea to try to remember to have a good time while you're on the track. For the factory stars, racing is a business, but the top riders have also discovered that a positive attitude makes the job a lot more rewarding. Taking the time to take care of yourself can pay big dividends on race day. For Team Suzuki, I'm Roger DeCosta. The U.S. Supercross Series on ESPN is being brought to you by Mobile. At we are back at Charlotte, North Carolina. Art Ekman along with David Bailey and Marty Reed. A packed house. More than 26,000 of the most loyal fans you're going to find anywhere in this small stadium. Let's take a look at the Suzuki starting grid for the 250 main event. It's something that sticks in my mind right now, Art, is the fact that every time LaRocco gets pretty close to McGrath in the championship chase, McGrath just opens it back up with another win. So that's probably on both of those riders' mind, and the night hasn't gone that well for either of them, both of them coming out of the heat race in fourth place. McGrath looking to tie Bob Hanna's record of 27 career wins as we look at the butterflies starting to fly down there at the gate. Walking through the pits earlier, we talked with the top four contenders. Oh, I'm concerned. We have five races left. I get right now is the the uh, you know the pending point. Usually it's before this, but since I've been you know I either win or not on the podium, so usually I'm more consistent than that. But I've been having bad luck every three three races that I've lost this year. I've been on the ground. So if I stay up, I have a pretty good chance of winning. I'd say. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely uh, consistency helps. Uh, you know, always at the end, the more points you can get, the better uh, each race. So. You know, all I need to do is just keep getting him behind me and, uh, you know, hopefully win the races while I'm doing it. And, and I hope he doesn't make the podium when he is behind me. So that helps a lot in points. And, uh, you know, we're getting closer, but, you know, not close enough. Yeah, I, I've kind of, you know, just kind of go with what the day is, you know. Don't, you know, may for a while we are concentrating so much on the bike and the setup and this and that and, and everything. And, and there was, like, so much going on with me during the races, you know, what tires, how the suspension's going, everything, and now I've kind of just concentrated, okay, I got two sets of tires, I'm gonna run either set, unless it's raining. And, you know, with set up the bike, we'll set up the bike right after the first practice, and then that's it. If we don't like that setup, we'll go back to what we had to begin with, and kind of minimize everything, and uh, kind of take some of the, uh, say, stress off me, and think about the track, think about the race, and stuff like that, and I think that's what's helped me out the last few weeks. I've been getting fourths and fifths, and not seconds and thirds. I, uh, I'm still just as strong as anybody at the end of the race, and I'm going just as fast as everybody out in practice today, so tonight, uh, maybe it's turnaround point. I might go from, uh, 
the two back of where I started to two in front of where I started. I set my goals at the beginning of the year being in the top five, and after the first five races, I upped them to the top three for this series, and uh, I still think I can get Mike back. He's only 10 points in front of me, and uh, that's not that big a gap. Also, David, they've been testing a new part, a 1995 part on his Nolene Yamaha machine, which has added a good deal of power. It was very noticeable in practice. Well, it's evident in Larry Ward's voice. He sounds a lot more confident than he's been in the past. He's going to need that here tonight. That's good to see after hitting the podium five times in the first five races and being off the podium now. A start underway. Emmy gets the whole shot. Henry Lampson, Albertine Ward, Craig LaRocco, all right there. Where's McGrath? McGrath is about ninth or tenth position. Well, he was slick, though. As we look at our Honda jump cam, McGrath was almost dead last into the first corner. He snuck around the inside and came out pretty good. In true McGrath style, there's Emig number six. Number four is Henry. Five is Lampson putting on a charge. And look at this battle for the lead early on. The two Honda riders putting the pressure on Emick. Emick doing this big double over the plateau, looking really strong. He's got a different set of lines than everyone else, and already it looks like he's got a little bit of a lead now. You can't get too far away on this small track, though. That traffic was interesting. Look at the whoop section. Henry skipping through him. McGrath was buried at the start to begin with, David. Look how far back he is. He's dead last in the corner. He knows there's nowhere to go. So put on the brakes, cut to the inside. He does it perfect. Sucks up a banner in his wheel. That could have caused a lot of problems. It spit it back out. But look at the places he made up by taking that inside line. Meanwhile, out front, Emig is being hassled by Henry and Lampson, a tight third. One of Lampson's best starts of the year. From the Honda Jump Cam, they're sailing by. And Emick nailing the whole shot lately. He's led a long ways in Houston and leading here again tonight. Appears to have everything under control. Usually a rider that kind of holds everybody up, but right now he's riding a fast pace. LaRocco getting by Ward, taking on Albertine. It was a good start for Albertine in his first race coming back from the injuries. But number two, LaRocco is on a dedicated charge to catch up with Lampson. Taking kind of a weird line way to the outside. Looked like it paid off as he uh, gets to the inside of... Greg Albertine and finally makes the pass stick, and here comes Larry Ward up the inside. Morocco and Ward headed for the whoops now as we look at the battle for the lead. Emig and Henry. Henry number four. Bar to bar on the triple. Henry a lot faster in the whoop section. Appears to be making up a lot of time. Takes the inside. Looks like he's got the lead. Oh! Henry goes down while in second place. That moves them all up. Morocco into third. Ward into fourth. What a bad break for Henry. When you go down early on like that on a track this tight, everybody goes by. Now he's way in the back of the pack, and it's a bummer coming out of that heat race. Emig with Lampson right on his tail. Take another look. Henry on the inside possibly hit his front brake lever on the elbow of Jeff Emig, locking that front wheel as slick as his track is. That sent him right to the deck. Emig taking a little bit of time coming out of that section, and Lampson was not hampered by Henry. He's picked up the gap, and look at Lampson. Lampson, this is his best Supercross of the year so far. And Emig looking strong everywhere but in the whoop section. That's where everyone's making up time, and I think Lampson senses if he can get around Emig, boy, he'd be a great buffer for everyone around, and possibly Lampson could get out to an early lead. We've got a tight group here as Lampson. He takes the lead from Emig. This is his first lead of the year. Can he hold back the Chargers? We'll find out after this. In Charlotte, 250 main event. Mike LaRocco making a charge out in front of Steve Lampson, but they're fairly tightly grouped right now. Look at uh, number six. That's Emmy. LaRocco to the inside. Jeremy McGrath and Larry Ward. A pack of four. McGrath now in sixth place. Well, he's come from pretty far off the pace. You saw how bad of a start he got. He's up in the thick of things. Right now, Emig appears to be holding up the pace. A freight train of riders behind him, and Lampson's getting away. Larry Ward passes both LaRocco and Emig. Oh, he's got a battle on his hands, though. Here comes LaRocco, number two. McGrath is just waiting, watching for mistakes. Well, there's going to be a lot of them here tonight. I think you got to be really smart on this racetrack. I mean, you got to be aggressive, but you've got to be smart. And right now, Larry Ward is looking sharp. Emig trying not to give up that fifth position to Jeremy. Lampson out in front, but it's Larry Ward and Mike LaRocco battling for second place. Don't rule out number one. Jeremy McGrath is just behind them right now. Ward in second place. Earlier, Marty Reed went looking for some of Ward's secrets. 
Larry Ward is one of the tallest riders on the series. He stands 6'3", and earlier this year, he was having a heck of a time keeping his butt on the seat. Now, they tried glue, but that made it too sticky. So what they've come up with, and it's ingenious, really, when you think about it, is untreated rubber. And if you put your hand on this, you can see, I mean, it has some definite traction to it. It's similar to what you'd find if you were at a drag strip or a racetrack where a lot of rubber had been laid down, and it's hot and it's tacky. It gives new meaning to the phrase, get a grip on it. Right now, Ward's got a pretty good grip on second place, but nothing is sured on this track. Emig has got a battle on his hands now with Jeremy McGrath. He makes the move. Nice block inside. Makes an easy pass. Well, it's easy, and Jeff Emig is really slowing up the pace. He was riding so defensive right there. It's pretty easy for McGrath to make that move. Now McGrath into fourth spot, and pretty clever, and not far out of touch with the leaders right now. Let's get out of Marty. I see on the sign you keep telling him to breathe and relax. I'll tell you, it looks like it's a holy terror out there. It looks like there's only one line. Yeah, but if he stays focused and does just that, breathe and relax, he'll do real good. Here he comes right by us again. He's in the lead by a good four to five bike length. In fact, it looks like everybody is fighting behind him, which is going to let him get a bigger lead. Yeah, as long as he rides smooth and lets these guys bang bars behind him, I think he'll do real good tonight. Good luck. Thanks. Lampson, number five, still in the lead with number 11, Larry Ward, right there. Ward made a little mistake about a lap ago. Let's go down and listen to Clint Berry, his mechanic. He's with Marty Reed. Clint, I just saw you give him a sign saying it's yours. He's in second place. You're that confident he can take him? Yeah, I really think he can, you know. The last three weeks, things haven't gone our way, but we're really working on it, and I really hope we can hang in there, you know. We just keep, keep on Lampson. He's got it closed down to about three bike lengths. What's been the difference? Because there's that stretch here recently where he couldn't find anything better than fifth. Well, basically, we had a few bike problems. We've been working on it, getting it all working better. He's really happy. Let's hope we can do it. Good luck. Thank you. But right now, with Lampson, Ward, LaRocco, and McGrath, it's anybody's race. Anybody's race. And right now, I think you got to look at the championship point standings. If McGrath can get up there and steal a win and hopefully get a couple of these guys between he and LaRocco, that sure looked good in the points. LaRocco still testing Ward for second place. Lampson with a pretty good little lead out in front. He's riding the best I've seen him ride all year. I, you know, it's sometimes you get buried in the pack, and he rides great, but you just don't have the results to show for it. And uh, right now, he's definitely got things going his way at LaRocco trying everything to get around Larry Ward. Ward just barely holding him off. Lap after lap, and now LaRocco has the corner he wanted. He's been working that outside line every lap, trying to make that pass, finally makes it stick, and guess who was watching? Jeremy McGrath. <laughs> yeah, Lampson, LaRocco, Ward, McGrath in that order, and boy, this points race could tighten even further with a LaRocco win, that's for sure. I guess the big question is, can the other riders hold McGrath off the podium? We'll be back in a moment. My name is Paul. Have you uh, heard about the Extreme Games? For the first time ever, nine same but different athletic contests. Never before brought together. Would be brought together here in small, scenic Rhode Island. Nine sports of the future up until June 24th. We have nothing to be scared of. Okay? Okay. We are back in Charlotte with all kinds of excitement. Lampson's out in the lead, but here's a battle for second, third, and fourth. Ward and Jeremy McGrath battling. Oh, LaRocco was slowed down. He must have hit that second triple very hard. He's holding his arm off the handlebar. Uh-oh. This is kind of like what happened to Pichon earlier in the day. He must have come up short and cased that and bent his wrist. Now, he's had lots of problems with wrists over the years, and uh, appears, appears as though he's out for the race. Not only out for the race, though, this is a, a big damper. It puts him out of the points race as well. And it depends how serious it is. Could it mean some of the outdoor races? Well, I can tell you, Mike LaRocco is one of the toughest riders out there. There you get a look at his dad, obviously very concerned. And, and Mike is uh, able to do quite a bit under a lot of pain. That's, I would think that's broken. Jeremy McGrath and Ward now in good position to make an attack on Lampson. And it'd be interesting to know what's going on inside of McGrath's head because by now he's got to know that LaRocco is out of the race and that's going to give him a huge points lead in this series. Boy, the pain must be shooting down that whole portion of the arm. Well, I can tell you, I've, I've injured wrists before and it, there's nothing quite like it. It hurts so bad and he's probably just doing whatever he's got to do to make that pain 
go away. I don't think it's going to. And right now, it's, there's got to be a million things going on inside of his mind. The championship's gone. The outdoors are coming up here in a couple of weeks. And is, is it broken? Is it not? What's, what's going to happen? LaRocco not finishing one of the motos in the first outdoor race at Gainesville, too. This would put him way behind. Well, it's just a heartbreaker for the guy. He's so talented and strong, and he never gives up, and he's just got all these problems to contend with. Lampson taking the lead over early in the race from Jeff Emick, still leading, but here comes number one, Jeremy McGrath. He's looking for his 27th career victory. Mike LaRocco walking back to the ambulance. That's his mother, May, to his right. They've got a, a field x-ray machine back at the ambulance, and uh, they'll be taking care of Mike LaRocco. A sad day for him. Jeff DeMent, number 77, is a lapper as number five as we take a look at the Honda stopwatch and see the interval. The lead that Lampson has on Jeremy McGrath, about 3.5 seconds. Ward in third place, Emig in fourth, number six. And look at number nine, the 125 rider out west, competes in the Eastern 250 circuit, Ryan Hughes, a nice job. Looking excellent, I'll bet he wishes he could ride the 250 every week. That's where he has the most success. Henry, after his crash early in the race, trying to catch up through the field for points. And Henry, I think if he can't be in the top three, I don't think he really cares. I, I know that he deserves to be up there. He's a good enough rider. He had the fastest heat race, looked like the fastest rider until he went down. It shouldn't be too long before he picks up his first main event win. Let's check out the Honda stopwatch now. The 125s made a lap in about 50 seconds, and we got 47.3 for the 250s. Yeah, the 250s aren't usually that much faster, but apparently uh, tonight, Lamson's got a pretty fast pace, and rightly so. He's got McGrath breathing down his neck. Well, especially on a tight track where your 125s lighter, easier to move around a little bit. LaRocco having that glove taken off the right wrist. Ooh, that's got to that's got send a shock through your system. Yeah, you can see the pain on him, but really, I mean, most people, if they had a broken wrist right now, they'd be making a lot more faces than he does. He's a tough customer. Back on the track, it's Lampson out in front, but not far behind is Jeremy McGrath and Larry Ward. Lampson into the corner. Oh, a little bobble there. He's going to be disappointed time-wise. Marty's now with the Rocket. Mike, this is not the way we wanted to talk tonight. Take us through what happened out there. Well, I just moved into second, and, uh, you know, I landed a little hard off that triple, and I was tripling into the corner, and when I hit it, my front end dropped, and, you know, I nosed right into it, and my arms were bent all the way back, and when I came up, I think it broke my wrist. Have they given you any word on your wrist? Is it sprained, or is it worse? I think it's broke. I'll be gone. Tough luck, man. Well, that painful look on Mike's face pretty much says the story, but I think more so emotionally, it's going to be, it's got to be so tough because now there's no way he can win the Supercross title and the national championship is in question. Incidentally, we've got confirmation that Pichon's injury was a sprained ligament to his right wrist. Back on the action now. Lampson out in front is really being tested by Jeremy McGrath. McGrath pretty much sizing him up right now. No mistakes for Lampson and the Wolves as he takes the corner. And Lampson bobbles again. Here comes Jeremy. Oh, my goodness. Jeremy looks back at his teammate as he takes the lead on the final lap. The slick Charlotte track got the best of Lampson in that corner. I think he just lost the front end and just handed this win to Jeremy McGrath in the last lap. A heartbreak for Lampson in his finest Supercross of the year. The mistake by Jeremy right there. Almost went down. Had to put his foot out, and Lampson is right there within striking distance. Well, Lampson doesn't want to bump his teammate, that's for sure. His record-breaking teammate. And Jeremy McGrath now has tied Bob Hanna with 27 career wins. Larry Ward right behind Lampson in third. Good ride for Larry Ward and a great ride from Lampson. I saw him do a little fist pump over the finish line as though he'd won the race. So he's obviously happy with second, although I think... Uh, he could have dug this a shade deeper. He could have come up with a win here. So McGrath, one win away from Rick Johnson's all-time record, and we'll be back in a moment. To get it. A beautiful evening in Charlotte, North Carolina, as we see the skyline of the Queen City. The rain holding back for a wonderful evening of racing, but a big turn of events as far as the 250 scene is concerned. Mike LaRocco's injury putting him out of the points race in Supercross and a tough time for the outdoor season. Here's the official results. McGrath, Lampson, Ward, Emig Hughes, the top five with Albertine making the top ten. Let's go to Marty Reed. He's with our third-place finisher, Larry Ward. 
Larry, I got to tell you, the last five races, no better than fifth, back on the podium. What was the difference tonight? Well, we got this Nolan Scissor Yamaha. We've been doing some testing, and I got to that first turn a little quicker tonight, and uh, it was a tight track. I was actually really nervous up there. I haven't been on the podium in a long time. The last four or five laps, uh, my arms pumped up pretty good. I was hanging on for a dear life, but um, towards the beginning, I got by LaRocco. You know, I was riding real good. Uh, this will boost my confidence again. I uh, told myself first five races I was on the podium. There's five left. I'm going to be on it every time, so... I'm started on my way to my goal for the rest of the season. Oh, see, I'm disappointed. I thought you were going to tell me it was that untreated uh, rubber that you're sitting on that uh, glued you to the seat. Well, that's what helped me get the good start. Now, honestly, I, I rode strong. I've been riding real hard. I've had a, some small irritating injuries the last couple races, and we got this Nolan Scissor bike running real good, and uh, I'll be back up to the rest of the year. Jeremy well on his way of tying another Bob Hanna mark. Three consecutive Supercross titles. The real battle between Kodrowski and Ward. Let's go to Lammy. Steve, I, I know you wanted to be in the number one slot, and, uh, of course, it, it ends up being your teammate who's going after unprecedented records. Uh, take us through it. What happened? Uh, I got a decent start, and I just kind of held back behind a few guys, and uh, I just got by the front guys right away and just kind of rolled my head down and looked ahead. And, you know, Jeremy was coming up on me, and, you know, I didn't realize there was only a lap left. I thought there might have been two laps left, and uh, I should have had him, but I kind of lost the front end in the, the corner after the hoops over there. I kind of lost it, and he kind of went underneath me, but... but I'm happy. I mean, I, I was a little nervous being up there. I haven't been up there all year, so uh, I'm happy getting second, but uh, coming that close to getting first, I uh, kind of bummed out. Steve Lampson led for 16 laps when on the very last lap, Jeremy McGrath took it over for victory. Marty Reed is with Showtime. Well, by now you know the mark. He's now tied with Bob Hanna. Eight wins this season, 27 in the career. When does it ever end? I mean, tremendous performance again tonight. Well, it's nice to get back on track, you know. Uh, like I said, I haven't won in a month. You know, we've had two weeks off out of three, and this is the fourth weekend, so I'm happy to get back on track here at Charlotte. You know, I've, Pontiac, I had a little bit of bad luck, and, you know, it's it's great to be able to tie the record of Bob Hanna and, and soon to maybe tie the record of Rick Johnson and beat it. But, uh, you know, first thing I'm looking at is that championship, and tonight I was trying to ride a safe, smooth race because the track's really tight, and... Uh, you know, there's not much room to pass. So I was wait waiting for mistakes. I, I got to ask you straight up. I mean, the heat race, it looked like a horrible start. This one looked like a horrible start. What was your evaluation? Well, my